Hello, and welcome to the week three hangout of the EDC MOOC. We're now swiftly into block two of the course, where we've been considering what it is to be human, um, particularly this week in relation to digital culture and education more generally. So um, I think most of you know us uh, already. I'm Jeremy Knox. I'm a lecturer in digital education here at the University of Edinburgh. And we also have Christine Sinclair, who's <laughs> saying hello there. We also have Hamish McLeod. Hello. Uh, Jem Ross and Sean Bain, my distinguished colleagues who are joining me for the next hour of um, scintillating conversation. So just to be clear uh, for, for this session, the first part we are going to hear from the team who you've just seen waving and they're each going to talk a little bit about something that's interested them from um, the previous two weeks, probably um, mostly this week. And then we'll try to bring in any responses from people who are uh, viewing the Hangout Live. So you can watch um, this Hangout, if you are watching it right now, on the um, YouTube channel. It's also going out on Google+, and it's also embedded in the homepage of the Coursera site. Um, so it's being recorded. You may be watching this later on, um, and it will be available um, from a link in the Coursera site. If you want to get involved, if you want to ask us some questions, if you want to comment on what we're saying, then please do get in touch. Probably the best way to do that is to send a tweet to the course hashtag, that's hash EDC MOOC, or you can comment um, in YouTube. Um, we've got our fantastic CTAs, Whitney and Rajiv, keeping an eye on um, any uh, tweets or comments in YouTube that come in. So if you do want to um, participate in some way, get in touch. That's probably what all I'm going to say to introduce the Hangout. So I think without any further ado, we'll head over to Sean, who's going to tell us a little bit about her thoughts, starting with um, Twitter this week. Sean. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, in the last Hangout, I talked a bit about the, um, the teacher bot and what, that, what was happening with that on Twitter. So I wanted to sort of return to that theme, if you like, um, by just talking a little bit about some of the exchanges there have been both in Twitter and in the Coursera discussion forums around uh, the use of Twitter and the teacher bot and so on. Um, the, the, our Twitter feed is quite quite active um, for this MOOC. We're get, getting around 50 to 70 tweets a day, um, although that's come down a lot from our high of 690 tweets on the 4th of November, which I think was the point at which our teacher bot was going a little bit crazy. Um, so, but there's very much a picture in which the teacher bot is dominating the Twitter feed at the moment, so our bot has, has um, generously donated over a thousand tweets to the MOOC, um, which is about ten times as many as, um, as, as Jeremy has posted as the next busiest user. So we're still seeing a kind of, we're still seeing a lot of teacher bot activity. Um, and then people have been commenting a little bit and talking about teacher bot a bit in the forum as well. Um, Gab uh, Gabrielle kicked off a, a thread in, uh, in which, which said, I, I, I thought it was a real teacher, um, and then I realized it was a bot. So this kind of, um, this kind of kicked off some discussion among people as to, as to uh, the extent to which a bot can or should uh, appear to replace the teacher. So a few people, Mike, Mike was said he doesn't really like the idea that um, a teacher bot can replace the real experience of, being talk of talking to a real EDC MOOC member. And a, a few people kind of agreed agreed with that. There seem to be people saying that although the teacher bot is quite entertaining, um, it's not a replacement for an actual teacher. Now, of course, that was never the intention that the teacher bot would be. Um, but it's been interesting to actually see the teacher bot unfolding over the last week or two, because I've been also at the same time write, trying to write a, a paper about teacher bot and about some of the ideas that have driven its development. Um, I've been reading a paper by Andrew Feenberg called Moder uh, Modernity Theory and Technology Studies in which he gives a really nice sort of case analysis of online higher education um, and the ways in which we kind of uh, technology in higher education has been spoken about, the kind of discourses that have circulated around online education and he kind of describes these as being two, twofold. There's a kind of um, a kind of technocratic kind of focus on um, the instru an instrumental use of technology in higher education to make higher education more efficient, to make teaching more efficient, um, to speed things up, um, to generate more income, a kind of neoliberal kind of 
um, assumption that by using technology we can we can make higher education more efficient in, in, in terms of a particular kind of um, business model, I suppose. So Feedberg is, it talks about how there's been a lot of resistance in the literature to to this idea. Um, and he says we need to respond. We need to respond to this, what he calls a kind of poverty of techno culture in higher education, by engaging in um, something called ontological designing. This idea that we can consciously construct technological worlds um, that he says that support a desirable conception of what it is to be human. And I thought that was really interesting because, in one sense, that's very much what we're trying to trying to do with the teacher bot is to kind of do this kind of ontological designing to sort of play about with this kind of boundary between um, human and automated teacher. But we're not really doing, our intention as a team in developing was never really to work with a desirable conception of what it means to be human. That takes us very much into the um, uh, the coursework that we've been doing this week on, on the MOOC. TeacherBot has been frantically retweeting this quote from Elaine Graham, which talks about, well, who, who exactly gets to define authoritative notions of what counts as desirable humanity in the 21st century? Um, that seems more an inter interesting question. Not that we should design teacher automation or critical positions on teacher automation with a view to um, kind of constructing a desirable conception of humanity, but that we should be using those things to probe what we mean by that term. So that, I find that a very interesting exchange helped me kind of really get to grips with some of my thinking around teacher book. Um, there was also another exchange in the discussion forum um, which Sheila Seckel kicked off around Twitter and overload. Uh, Sheila's, Sheila's point was that Twitter is a medium too far for the MOOCs. It's too much, there's too much going on, too many different um, social media channels and too many different forums in which to speak. Um, and Parker Negi came in and, and kind of backed her up on that, she, it, it saying, you know, we, we're assigned to make two contributions a week in various media. Everyone's going to choose the forum that they feel most comfortable with, but it means we're missing out on so much. Um, we'll never know what's happening in Twitter if we, if we don't use Twitter. Um, so that kind of made me think about, I don't know if you remember, earlier this year there was a lot of discussion in the, on the... Um, in the blogosphere, I guess, around Twitter dying, you know, Twitter's user figures are dropping month by month, its share value is dropping. Um, the Atlantic published a, an article, I think it was called a eulogy for Twitter, saying Twitter is dead, everyone's going elsewhere. Um, and then there was an interesting counter article in Slate which said actually Twitter's not dying, it's thriving, but Twitter is now, it's becoming a platform, it's not a social um, networking site, it's a social media platform. So it's really about kind of news and news produ production and consumption rather than about people networking together. And that made me actually, that turned a light on for me because it made me realize that that's kind of what's been happening with the teacher bot in a way. Um, my impression of what the teacher bot has done to the MOOC Twitter feed is that it's made it a much more centralized structure where people are, uh, all, all the um, exchanges or most of them are happening between the teacher bot and individual users and there's not very much exchange going on between users themselves. And I think that's really interesting and um, I was speaking to our colleague um, Pete Evans who's really, who's a kind of social, uh, who does social network um, analysis and he's going to produce some social network maps of what's been happening in, in Twitter this time as opposed to the last time we ran the MOOC and I think that will be a really interesting way of finding out more about the kinds of social networks that the teacher bot has been um, kind of uh, forcing us into if you like. Um, so just before I end, I wanted to say that if anyone out there who's listening uh, or watching um, would like to, to, to feed to me directly about their experience of the teacher bot and what it's been like for them and what they think it should do or could do or has been doing, please email me. Um, here's my email address. Um, just drop me an email and we can fix up a time uh, either to talk on Skype or have some email exchanges. I would love to hear, um, sorry, I'll keep that up. I would love to hear um, people's views on what we've been doing with our teacher bot. And on that, I will stop and hand back to Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. That was really great. And it's, a, it's an aspect of the teacher bot that I guess I haven't really thought through that much, is its kind of deep-seated relationship to Twitter. You know, the way we kind of understand and the way people are sort of understanding the teacher bot is very much to do with that kind of rapidity of uh, responding is kind of a, very much an aspect of Twitter. Um, rather than it just being a bot, it's very much a Twitter entity. So um, that's a useful way to think about the bot, I think. Um, Jen, I think we're going to go straight over to you now. I know you've been interested in some images which are also 
dealing with this idea of the teacher. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I've been um, really loving and getting really fascinated by some of the images that are coming into our Flickr page this week um, as part of the EDC MOOC Week 3 image competition. Um, if you haven't had a chance to post an image or create an image yet for that and you want to, there is still time. Uh, you can look on the MOOC site to find out how to enter and what's involved. And if you um, if you do, then you can uh, probably over the next couple of days still um, have a chance to get some feedback. And if people are looking at your images and voting for your images, then um, you may have the opportunity to win a fantastic University of Edinburgh badge. So that's worth you know, thinking about over the next couple of days. Um, so I wanted to spend a few minutes and talk about some of the images that I like this week and that were thought-provoking for me. Um, I'm going to share my screen and be able to show you. Yeah, that's working. Um, the three, uh, three images that I was hoping to be able to talk about a bit. This is the first one um, doesn't have a title, but it's from Leonidas Fountas, who has created this image, which is uh, a sort of vintage photograph of a classroom with um, a teacher figure um, represented by a sort of green electronic code type pattern. Um, so the, the image is a very traditional classroom, um, but with a very untraditional teacher, if you like. And I just thought this was a really fascinating representation of some of the things that we've been discussing over the last few weeks. Um, the first thing that I suppose jumped out for me was to wonder whether this is a representation of a teacher made out of code, so an online teacher perhaps, um, or whether the, the, the code itself is in some sense being represented as the teacher here, like for example MOOCbot. Um, and I really like the ambiguity of that, that question. I think it's an open question that this image poses. Um, and the other thing that really jumped out for me was to wonder um, whether this was, you can see, for, you know, this is a very old photograph, obviously, with something new um, superimposed onto it. Is this saying that um, the nature of the teacher is changing, but other things are not changing so quickly or not changing at all, perhaps? Um, and if that's the case, then I wonder, you know, what that means. Um, are we focusing more on the, um, on the changes to teaching and the teacher than, than some of the other changes that may may not be happening in our um, in our educational spaces. And I like the use of the vintage photograph because it's effective in pulling code, I suppose, out of its historical contexts and drawing attention to how contested and ambiguous, um, as Michael Rodriguez said of the human in the week three forums this week, how, how contested and ambiguous the nature of education and technology actually is. And when you see things out of place and out of time like that, um, it's, it draws attention to that, I think. And so I, I really liked that as well. Um, and, and finally, I guess, uh, there's some text in this image which you might not be able to see. Um, on your screen, but I can see it on mine. There's a, a sign behind the teacher that says, be mindful of small things, um, and something else that says, honesty is the best policy. And I was thinking about mindfulness and honesty and wondering whether and to what extent these are qualities that we need in our engagement with some of the topics that we're addressing um, on this MOOC and in digital education more generally. So thank you so much, Leonidas, for this really thought-provoking image, which I, I like a lot, as you can probably tell. Um, this is the second image that I'd like to say a few things about. This is from Anahit Arminyakin, and I, it came, I actually encountered it in the blogs um, rather than initially in Flickr, so I encountered it in the context of um, a really, really interesting blog post uh, about the MOOC and the things that were going on and I guess picking up on the points that Shan was making um, about overload um, and the experience of being overwhelmed um, in MOOC space, in online learning space. So this, the first thing that ju really jumped out for me was this word cloud and how it's um, emerging from a phonograph which for me has echoes of the Bendito Machine film that we watched and the sort of technologies past, I suppose, um, that, that nonetheless still um, have the ability to, 
to be evocative and to, to haunt our experiences of education in the present. Um, so I, I liked that, and I thought that was really interesting. And the other thing, um, and I'll read you a bit from Anna Heat's blog post in order to illustrate this um, more. I can't explain it as well as 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 she has. So, um, so she said, "Have you read Three Men in a Boat by J.K. Jerome? Do you remember that part where George realizes he has every single disease, ailment, and injury detailed in the medical encyclopedia, excepting housemaid's knee?" She goes on to say, with every single article assigned to this course, I discover that I am determinist, more specifically a linguistic one, no, wait, technological, hmm, universalist, or maybe warfianist, pessimist, futurist, nihilist, positivist, grr, so many isms and ists, my head is spinning. Calm down, breathe, and take the book. The touch, the smell, the feeling of paper calms down the whirlpool of terms, notions, meanings, metaphors, and brings up questions. Um, and I mean that's obviously just extremely uh, evocative of the experience of being swamped and overwhelmed by stuff, um, by by ideas, and actually how the materiality of the book itself might be able to pull us back um, into a, a calm, calmer sense of control. Um, and that reminded me of the monk reading that we did this week, um, which was making the very strong argument that the computer um, is, uh, I suppose, a, a thin way of thinking about learning and education because it's just about, it just deals in abstractions and symbols and information. Um, so Monk says, a computer can inundate a child with mountains of information. However, all of this learning takes place the same way through abstract symbols decontextualized and cast on a two-dimensional screen. Contrast that with the way children come to know a tree by peeling its bark, climbing its branches, sitting under its shade, jumping into its piled up leaves. These first-hand experiences are enveloped by feelings and associations, muscles being used, sun warming the skin, and blossoms scenting the air. Uh, and there's lots and lots that could be said about that, but I suppose the thing that I wanted to say, um, and in keeping with our discussion of metaphors last week, is that I think this, these metaphors that are coming out of Anna Heath's um, post and out of Monk's paper about information as nature out of proportion or out of control, so there's the discussion of mountains of information, of whirlpools um, of data and ideas, and then that's contrasted with, the na with nature and the material that can be controlled, um, that is more, uh, more open to being um, being understood and controlled by by people and even children um, and maybe those things in some sense are controllable because they exist for us and I wondered whether this particular way of thinking about the human and the non-human is is problematic for us in thinking about education what sorts of problems does thinking about um, the not the, do the domination of nature versus the domination of the human cause for us um, and as Shan was saying a couple of minutes ago as well, who, who defines this vision of what it means to be human, what it means to really learn? Um, and I, I think these are really important and interesting questions that this image raises. Um, and so that was my second choice of images. And thank you, Anahit. I really enjoyed the blog post and the image. And finally, and I only really have a few things to say about this one, um, other than that I love it, uh, I only just saw it this afternoon, and it's called Feeling Sad um, by Nib Maker. And I guess uh, I think it looks ahead to next week and to starting to disturb the line, if there is a line between the human and the non-human and the nature of humanity and asking questions through image, if you like. Um, and I don't know, maybe this is just because what I, when I look at it, what I see is um, sad robot eyes. And I thought, yes, that's definitely what that is. And then I thought, oh, but I've just watched Robbie um, again from next week's materials. And of course, I would be seeing s sad robot eyes. And so will you when you watch it. So um, I wanted to also say thank you to Niv Maker for this really beautiful, evocative image. Um, so that's, that's that, really. Uh, and really, if you want to see what you could win if you enter the image competition, here it is. Um, this is the beautiful University of Edinburgh pin that could be yours. So if you're thinking about making an image, if you want to have a go at trying to express some of the themes from this week or any of the weeks of the course so far in image form um, and have us looking at it and, um, and making things up about them, 
um, then please do. Uh, it would be great to see more of the things that you're creating and thinking about in image form. And as I say, check the site and find out how to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. I think if ever there was an opportunity to think about how exciting it is to work with images and how rich they are, and, and you know, as a and that's what makes the um, competition such a great thing to get involved with. So, just to reiterate what Jen was saying, there still is time to create and get your um, images into the um, week three competition. Um, and I think also what I was thinking about a lot when you were talking, Jen, was the final assignment. I know that's something that Hamish is going to talk about towards the end of the um, session just now. But I think what you seem to do really well there is open up the possibilities of how you can creatively communicate with images and also what it does when you try to read them and how it helps you to understand things. And I think that's a great demonstration of the of the value of working with um the image competition, but also the digital artifact that um, kind of caps off caps off this MOOC. So talking about, I think you mentioned looking towards week four um, in one of those images. I know that's something that Christine also wants to touch on when she talks about um, some of the discussions that she's been interested in this week in the MOOC. Christine. OK, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, and in fact, I'm looking back to week two a little bit. Um, and uh, also thinking about week three and then moving in, I think, to week four. Um, and I want to say a bit about empathy, because I found a really interesting thread that Mark Allenby started in the middle of week two. I really like the title of this, Electronic Me Media and the Decay of Empathy. And Mark's worried about the way electronic media emphasize what he calls outward behavior. Um, he writes of a theory that the rise of empathy in the 17th to the 19th centuries was the result of increased literacy, um, and particularly the, the first person novel. That's stories where the writer uses I um, so that thoughts can be captured. And the novel, he says, uh, put readers inside the heads of others. And this was the first time it was seen to be be happening, that readers could actually see other people's thoughts. And Mark's concerned that with the way things are, are going now um, with electronic media, that we might be losing this ability to empath empathize with others. Now, I was interested to see this as a response to our week two deliberations about the future and the visions that Mark was uh, seeing of technology in, in week two knowing that we were going to be talking about the human in week three uh, and because I'd recorded the the week three introduction the 18th century philosopher from week three from this week David Hume um, has particularly been associated with empathy he he was seen as being one of the people that that started off that, that gave the foundation for these ideas so he referred to it as sympathy he didn't use the word empathy. Now I'm going to see if I can go into my screen share and remind you uh, about Hume. No, it's not coming up. It worked fine in rehearsal, as it always does. Never mind. Um, j just a, a reminder that Hume is the, the, the big statue um, it, that, that we have in Edinburgh of somebody who used to be at the University of Edinburgh in the 18th century and uh, um, and talked about understanding and he particularly particularly talks about sympathy in terms of the ideas of the affections of others that are converted into the very impressions they represent so Hume recognizes that there's something about our human nature which makes us sympathetic to other people which leads into uh, a, a wish to discuss morality. And I'm sorry my screen shares decided not to work because um, I could have shown you what Haley's done with this. You'll just have to go and have a look. Look, idea about empathy meaning getting inside someone else's head by putting my head on top of the Hume statue. Um, and I think I'd have been better off with Hume's brains rather than his rather chilly body. But um, but I suppose this is where I might go with uh, 
transhumanism myself in week four, Haley. So uh, a lot to live up, a lot to live up to having Hume's body in my my head. A really quite scary thought. Anyway, back back to Mark's thoughts about the rise of empathy, um, and these were around about the same time as as Hume in the 18th century. Uh, this idea of the first person novel. Marx particularly worried about violence. If we're not getting these inner thoughts, um, but just seeing violent behavior, perhaps, we're just going to lose this uh, something about understanding and empathizing with other people. And I think Liam in the same thread sharing these concerns. And he points out how television has desensitized us to all the pain and suffering that we see, just because there's so much of it. I understand that, I think. And for this reason, Liam thinks that blogs might not provoke empathy in the same way as novels do, even though they are written in the first person, uh, using I, just because there are so many of them. And perhaps, I suppose, we, we read them more quickly as well. And I do understand that, though I have been feeling empathy, I, th I think, when I've read blogs in EDC MOOC News this week and in previous weeks. So I think blogs do actually encourage empathy. Um, now other people came back with both support and counter examples. Uh, they, they didn't think it just has to be text and the idea of inner speech that gives you empathy. And Bill offers Inanimate Alice. I don't know if you've seen that, that book um, that's been born digital, but it it succeeds because of the empathy generated by the main character. Uh, I've heard about Inanimate Alice and have been meaning to look at it for a while, so I've started to look at it prompted by Bill, thank you. Um, Natalie asks, will people really want to read novels anymore? She talks about spark notes, not, not everyone will heard of this, but uh, the sort of summaries and commentaries that you get if you're going to be writing about literature in an essay or assignment. And that's a depressing thought for us, for those of us who love novels, like I presume Anna Heat, whose, whose picture Jen's just shown. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, is no one reading for pleasure anymore because things are going too quickly? Well, I still am. Um, and in a similar vein, Nina felt that digital culture seems to make our existence much more calculated. So perhaps things are moving quickly, there are too many distractions, uh, but we need to, to think about uh, what we, we need to use the digital for. So these were all very interesting themes last week, and I wondered, will they carry over into our discussions of the human? And I did a, a search for empathy in this week's forums, and it does come up again. Joe Lockwood has started a thread relating to the human element, and in fact it's the human element, uh, of course, as you might expect, where people start talking about, I really like the human touch and this kind of, this kind of idea. Joe's been using the, our questions that we asked in the commentary on the readings. We like it when you do that, but we like you to have your own as well. Um, so there was one question, why are video and audio constructed here as more human? than, for example, text. And Joe's answer made reference to empathy, particularly in relation to conversation. So you, if you're having a conversation with somebody, you can see and hear them, and it, it creates an empathetic or an empathic response. But this thread and others show that there are mixed views on the paper, the human element. Brenda feels that technology dehumanizes teaching. She saw that in the paper and agrees with it. Ida, though, thinks that the dichotomy between face-to-face -face and online is nonsense. Um, there, there shouldn't be that, that division with one being more human than the other. Maria and Dot don't think we need more audio and visual to make us more human online. She, they say that that's an illusion. And this is something that we've been experimenting with and exploring. Uh, we didn't think uh, that you needed the audio and visual, but, but we decided we would add the, the introductory videos just to 
to let you see us because there seemed to be such a strong reaction to our Google Hangouts. Uh, Chintzia um, argues that feedback's more important rather than actually seeing and hearing people. And feedback can be text or just small interactions. Uh, just the fact that uh, the teacher is present or the peers are present and making comments on things. So, uh, a, a long diatribe about empathy, a subject that interests me, is it more likely to be stimulated through text and the opportunity to, to read in a speech? Or is it more likely through multimodal presentations? And does it matter anyway? How important do we think it is for education or for teachers? Perhaps we shouldn't even be worrying about empathy at all. And there's a thread started by uh, Michael asking why we're using humanism as a lens on education. I thought that was a nice note to end on. I'll hand it over to everyone else. Why do you think we're using humanism? Is it anything to do with empathy? Or is that completely irrelevant to what we should be thinking about in terms of e-learning and online education? Thanks so much, Christine. That, I, I thought that was a fascinating way of um, thinking about the links through the different weeks um, of the MOOC. I know that we, when developing it, we had certain ideas about the structure of the course and how things would develop. And so it's always nice to hear how people move through the different kind of topic areas of the course and construct uh, kind of meaning by doing that. So I thought that was really great. Does any, would anybody like to respond now to that question before we move on? Um, I, I could respond. Uh, it's, do, you, do you mean to the question about why we're using humanism as a lens yes. for looking at education? Um, well, I kind of think we're probably actually using post-humanism as a, as a lens to look at education in this particular uh, MOOC, and I think we're doing that as a kind of strategy, really, for thinking about the ways in which education and educational research and educational practice has been kind of founded on a particular set of humanist ideals. Um, so we, um, I'm sort of quoting loosely from uh, Robin Usher and Richard Edwards' book on, on postmodernism and higher edu and education, but we kind of tend to think about education as being about bringing out a certain kind of human subject, about helping people realize their full potential as, 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 as human beings, uh, learn how to become rational and self-motivated and self-directing. Um, so we've kind of tended to see, and in fact I think education has to a large extent been built upon this kind of enlightenment project of, um, of kind of a, a bringing out of a true humanity. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's interesting to look at education from that perspective if we think about humanism um, is, and the critique of humanism that's been mounted in, in, in sort of philosophy and theory for the last couple of decades really looking at how actually to an extent there are aspects of humanism which are complicit in um, oppressive practices um, this issue about control over who it, what it means to be human who gets to define exemplary humanity what it means to be human is defined to a large extent by power by the social by access to the material um, so we might want to look again at education if we accept the perspective that education is built on a kind of humanism what does it mean if we start to challenge that humanism and try to think differently um, about what education is and could be. So that, that would be my answer. That's why it's, it's, well, for me, it's not just an important issue. It's probably the most important issue currently facing us as educators, to be honest, in a time of sort of rapid technological um, shift and social change. So yeah, that's my answer. So does that mean um, that the concept of empathy in the first place is problematic? Like, is that what, so, so Christine and some of the um, the MOOC participants this week have been talking a lot about empathy and, and where it's located in the digital, but are you saying that the idea of empathy as a sort of human quality is is something we need to bring into question anyway? Yeah, I'd need to do more reading and thinking about the notion of empathy, but yeah, for me, yeah, empathy feels like a kind of humanistic response, um, maybe a little, a, sort of a, a slightly essentialist about it's a kind of a natural human position to feel empathy for another human and I would never say that that's not important because it absolutely is but we might want to um, you know think about it in different terms can we does, does the teacher bot seem to be empathetic for example in responding to students can we feel empathy or pity for a, um, a, an automaton I mean I know Hamish 
I know Hamish can feel pity for Automata because he's he's told us that in the past, and I I feel the same. So there's a whole body of I suppose science fiction from Blade Runner to um, to her looking at the notions of empathy between um, automated agents and human agents. Uh, so yeah, I guess I would just want to probe a little bit about whether empathy is a human quality or potentially a post-human quality. It's quite an interesting question. There's an interesting question up on Twitter at the moment from uh, Noel, who asks um, if asking if anonymity is related to the ease with which you can um, feel empathy. So I wonder if that relates to some of the points you've been making. So she talks about how certain um, in certain networks, certain social networking sites, the ability to be anonymous might affect that in some way. It, and it seems to be that it goes in both directions, a bit like um, audio and visual, that, that some people will think anonymity allows for, for more empathy um, and maybe a feeling of, of safety, and others feel it actually detracts from empathy because you don't know who you're talking to um, or you don't know who you're in communication with. It seems to go both ways when you have these discussions, uh, depending on different views of, of what people are, I suppose. I think for me that there's a question there um, about the about the the idea of the other, right? So, so when we don't know who, you know, this 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 argument about um, anonymity and not being able to know who you're dealing with, um, you know, maybe there's an extent to which that is a test of our empathy. Um, if we can, if we can empathize with the other and not know who or what the other is, um, that seems to me to be an interesting um, challenge for us in the kind of, I suppose, in the digital age or whatever. Um, how, you know, how other does something have to be before we no longer feel we can, um, we can feel pity for it or can empathize with it? Um, is, is the anonymous other a, a challenge for us, a test for us um, of, our, of our empathy? or a test for the definition of empathy, which maybe does need to evolve in the light of, of new experiences. I mean, it started off in Hume's day and Adam Smith, I think, uh, also, they were talking about sympathy rather than empathy. Um, they didn't have that word, and uh, uh, eventually, I think it became felt that another word was needed for this, this um, quality that goes beyond compassion uh, and actually goes into understanding, seeing another person's point of view, rather than just feeling sorry for them. Perhaps no p compassion probably is nearer empathy. But there are all sorts of different definitions going on, and I think we possibly need to extend that now that we've been uh, exposed to other um, ways of of exploring our humanity and our post-humanity as well, we maybe need to extend how we define empathy. But I think if I could, at the risk of getting drawn into another um, description of my empathy with robots, um, we seem to have something in the, in the news in the UK at the moment, and I guess there will be examples everywhere on the, the planet about trolling and the idea that bad things happen online because of anonymity that uh, both we f behave in ways that are, are bad because we feel that nobody can see us and we are drawn into behaving unkindly to people online because we don't really feel them and we don't see the damage that, that we're causing. Um, and I, <clears throat> I think that is really interesting I, and I, again I probably come from a very, very different uh, position from, from Shen, Sean and Jen and everybody else, you know, thinking that there are some... Jen, things. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, Freudian slip and all that. I, I'm being followed, incidentally, on Twitter by Sig Sigmund Freud. Um, um, oh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, that it, it is something about us which draws us into our engagement with the inanimate. Or, or the technologically um, animated. It's not something about the uh, the technology itself. It's something about us. And the other thought I was having was um, 
and again I'll sort of use this word essential, the, the, the sort of essential dialogue of being human that perhaps the social and perhaps the educational interaction is best understood as being fundamentally dialogic. That, that's not, we, we start as individuals and we incorporate the other, but actually we start as something which is in conversation and various things in the world, and some of them are people, enter that, that, that dialogic space. Thanks, Henry. That, uh, that seems like a good point to head into. I know you wanted to talk more um, this week about the kind of psychological effects of um, technology. So that seems like a good point to do that. Do you want to yes. do that? Yeah, yeah sure. I, 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 coming in at the end, I always feel that I want to go off and talk about the things that other people have raised. And then I also often feel that the things that I've been uh, planning to say, other people have already said. But let, let me see how I get on. Um, yes, I wanted to make some general observations uh, 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 about something which, which I thought was quite prominent was the, the very, very different ways in which people have been uh, participating over these weeks and the inevitable fact that, that others have mentioned earlier that, that this means that things don't join up. Um, so I saw someone observing, for example, that they had come across many, uh, they could say about that they hadn't come across many of the forum ideas that they'd found us mentioning in the, in the hangout. Um, and that didn't seem to bother this particular writer, uh, and they were just happy to, to move along. But it does seem to, to bother some people, to distress some people that they can't, as it were, keep up. So Sean was talking about the anxieties of um, not being able to keep up with the, the, the density of Twitter activity and, and so on. Um, that's clearly a source of stress for some people, and, and perhaps even a, a reason to, to fall away from engagement with, with a, an online learning experience or in general, the, the MOOC in particular. Um, although it's very diff difficult by definition to, to know why people fall away and step back. Um, but I thought there was a particular example of this um, in people's emerging engagement with the course assignment. Uh, and I thought I would just say a little bit about, about that um, uh, to reassure people, I guess. Um, uh, but it was interesting the extent to which some people uh, had felt intimidated. Uh, and I use that word because it was used by someone uh, in, a, in a blog post um, when they looked at our links to collections of previous participants' work, or, or indeed it's worse than that, previous participants, collections of previous participants' work. You know, there, there, there's some fantastic stuff out there circling around about the, the work on, on EDC MOOC. Um, and, and this was coming from somebody who had been using the MOOC as a resource in, their, in a class that they were teaching. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, later on. And he said that his students had felt intimidated by some of the assignment specification um, and also by my video, uh, which I found um, distressing, although he was kind enough to suggest that he might just have been teasing a little bit. Um, but we certainly don't want people to feel intimidated. Uh, and Jen was talking about the, the, uh, the image competition and the great stuff we've, we've seen there. Um, nobody can keep up. Uh, we certainly keep, can't keep up. Uh, and nobody need feel discouraged by looking at past work. It, it's somebody else's work. And what we're interested in now is what what you would want to bring forward. Um, although um, there's decades of social psychology that suggests that that's how the human mind works. It compares itself with others, and, and, and that's problematic. Um, so yes, thinking about, about some of the, the, the psychological aspects of participating online, psychology is my back. Uh, excuse me, is my background, so um, uh, it's interesting to look at, at what's coming up. And I think that there's, um, if you like, uh, an effects rhetoric that people sometimes drop into, which is what are the psychological effects of engagement with technology or using technology for communication, um, and talking about the ideas like, like presence and what it is to cultivate presence, and uh, as, as others have said, earlier what it, what it does to feelings of presence to engage through a text medium or through an audio or visual uh, medium, medium. I think these are very, very um, 
interesting ideas. But what's coming across is that different styles of communication are clearly favoured by different sorts of people. And then we ask interesting questions about uh, about what we might mean by different sorts of people. Um, some nice little quotations which I came across. The, the determination, for example, that the tool uh, that, that the technology is a tool and not a master, um, and that we've got to, to uh, retain agency here. Um, somebody else, uh, I think it was a, a blog post title, it's not about the technology, it's about me. And again, I think that's a particularly interesting one. It, it, the, the, it's, about, it, it's about me idea, um, I think, can be a great emancipator, um, if by that you mean that we can see ourselves in control. On the other hand, sometimes one sees the it's not the technology, it's me response coming from people who are you know, slipping into this mode of being uh, intimidated by the technology and internalizing the blame for the, the difficulties that we encounter. C coming back briefly, um, uh, just watching my clock here, um, to the, the notion of folks who have been using the MOOC res as a resource with their own classes. Uh, and somebody was talking about this notion as as the blended MOOC, and I, I thought that was that, that was really very interesting. I love this idea, um, and I think the phrase that was used was the on ground teacher. So we've got the on ground teacher who's using the MOOC resource with their group of students round about them, which I guess that makes us the ethereal teachers. Um, who are not on ground in that particular context. But as I say, I'd love to hear more um, about um, uh, folks who, who are doing this, who are using the MOOC resource, working with groups of students that they are working with locally. Um, and I, if I had a label to hold up, it would be h.a.mcleod at ed.uk. You can find me online. Uh, but again, uh, folks who are doing that would really be very interested to, to hear more. Um, I have a new SF recommendation, I, which sadly I've already managed to buy on, um, on, online. Other bookshops are available. Um, it's called Feed by Matthew Tobin Anderson. So um, thanks. Forgive me, the rest of you are so good at remembering the names. I, I just remember ideas and I lose the names. I don't, I hope no one regards that as, as discourteous or dismissive. No, we just write them down, Hamish. We don't remember well, them. But, but, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope you don't regard that as disorganized or incompetent. <laughs> um, yes, sorry. So feed, I must go away and read that. Um, and, um, oh yes, another, just a, a quotation to, to, to close with and maybe we'll come back to, to some of these ideas but uh, someone wrote glad to be here but convictions shaking will I emerge unscathed to which I suppose the answer would be I hope not but you know not unscathed but undamaged well, I'll stop there thanks Jeremy thanks so much Amos I'm really loving these poetic quotes this session has been fantastic. Uh, I also, really appreciate. And write down the attributions next time. I um, I do apologise. You know who you are, <laughs> and you are appreciated. I think the comments on the assignment and kind of worries about participation as well, I'm sure, will be greatly appreciated. And and I think that was a great demonstration of empathy from uh, Hamish there. So that's fantastic. Um, I've now realised that for the next. Um, Hang, any other hangout sessions that we have, we all are going to have to write our email addresses down on pieces of paper, ready to hold them up. That's something so, we must definitely put in our uh, development plans. There is this thing called the interweb, and I hear that you can look people up and find their names and addresses. So. And I don't play soccer for Canada, if you look me up. <laughs> but, yeah, interestingly, there aren't very many Hamish McLeods, but there are a few. So, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so forgive me, Jeremy. I was going to say um, uh, I I found myself empathising with the, the Twitter bot this afternoon as it was asking whether or not it could come to the MOOC, and I'm sure I've already told it that it can come to the to, to, to the hangout, that it can already come to the hangout, but it 
doesn't seem to be listening um, to me. So uh, I felt sorry for it. Well, that's interesting. We've had we had a tweet um, a couple of minutes ago from Richard saying that um, he likes the teacher bot, but he couldn't. He didn't feel like he could. He feel empathy for it. So there's clearly some differing views on on the bot there. Um, can I jump in, Jeremy, and just say that um, I was interested in Hamish's discussion about the um, the blended. Did you say the blended MOOC, Hamish? Jeremy. Right, okay, I'm unmuted. Um, uh, yes, this is the blended Scottish MOOC. Blended is, Scottish MOOC. Is that um, right? Um, uh, I think that was where I, I got this observation from. And uh, yes, the notion of a blended MOOC was using the MOOC resource, working with one's own students. Um, and um, Well, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no that, that was... Uh, um, well, I was I was just going to say that um, some some colleagues of ours in the states, um, Amy Collier and Mike Caulfield, have done some work on a concept that that they have called um, the distributed flip. And if people are interested in that, um, it also talks about ways in which resources like MOOCs might be used in multiple different locations by different groups of people simultaneously, um, and what the what the impact of that is and, and what it might look like. So, um, so I like the the idea of the blended MOOC, but um, the 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 term distributed flip might also be interesting to people if they want to look that up and um, explore it further. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I I mean I I think there's an interesting question about why resources tend not to be reused. Okay, I mean I'll generalize wildly, but there, you know there's a problem uh, that we've encountered over the years where people create resources and and those resources um, would be available openly, but they tend not to be reused. And, and people talk about the not in not invented here syndrome, as if there's something um, that's judged negatively because I I didn't create it, and yet we don't feel that about textbooks. Uh, but I think something about the you know, reuse of the MOOC is that it's not a dead thing, because there's a feeling that that um, open educational resources are somehow uh, dead. And forgive me, I don't want to be critical of a particular instance of open educational resources. There are some fantastic resources out there, but perhaps the MOOC is something which will. Um, will draw people in because it has an ongoing existence and it has a, it's bubbling in in some senses. Uh, so I, I just find this this uh, this whole notion really very very interesting because it does seem to be um, a potential way of thinking about how MOOC resources might be used in the future. I think that's a really interesting point, Hamish. And for me, I was starting to think about how a lot of the ways. MOOCs have been described as a kind of broadcast medium. So when you start to think about reuse, that's one interesting way in which you might think about MOOCs not as kind of emanating from institutions, but actually things which are being recast, um, augmented, changed, and um, made again elsewhere, which is an interesting to think about way to think about them. I think. But I think perhaps maybe the distributed flip is is uh, particularly interesting because that anticipation of distributed use is built in. And I don't, th sorry, I'll speak for myself and my colleagues can totally contradict me, but I don't think we knew what was going to happen when we started to engage with this MOOC activity. And we're finding out the ways in which people are using the MOOC, our MOOC. Um, but if one can think about how reuse and uh, and distributed use can be engineered in from the outset, then that would be good. It is so good. Any, but I, sorry. If anybody has any ideas on reuse and designing in reuse, here's my email address. <laughs> this is now the international sign for. Here's my email not. address. <laughs> Are you mocking me, Jeremy? Not at all, and I should no. say there's been some uh, compliments on Twitter about your um, whole, uh, use of the, uh, the email. <laughs> you're, you're getting respect not just from me, but from the community. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody's uh, tweeting about distributed flip, I see. Oh, good. Somebody's asking about you at the book recommendation, Hamish. Was it, was it feed or feet? Feed, I beg your pardon, feed. 
Um, yes. Um, it looks very. It looks very interesting. Uh, the the post that I saw. Thank you for whoever you were who posted it. Um, uh, had included a, a, a video uh, review of the book. It looked very really, very interesting. I, th I think it's a book for young adults, so that should just about be appropriate money. Well, this hour has really flown by, um, so it seems to have gone by very quickly. But I just wanted to make sure I get two things in before we draw things to a close. And the first thing is the image competition. So just to reiterate what Jen was saying earlier is that the competition is still open. It's a fantastic way to start thinking about doing things with images, perhaps ready for the um, final assignment of the digital artifact. You can still enter the competition. We very much encourage you to do that. And we won't be um, thinking about closing the competition till around mid next week. Um, at which point we will uh, go ahead and look at the hashtags in Flickr River and um, and with the use of the algorithms therein decide um, who the winner of our wonderful badge is. We re also recognize that Flickr might not be the preferred place for everybody to share their images. So if you don't want to share your image there and but you still want to create one, you don't necessarily have to formally enter that competition. So please do put it somewhere, share it, tweet it, get it into the forums, and I'm sure you'll get some useful comments on the on your images. The second thing I want to say before we uh, close up is talk a little bit about the hangouts in the net in the last two weeks of the course. In week one and right now, we are having more of a formal hangout where we've the teaching team have discussed things that have happened during the MOOC. We want to change that format a little bit for the last two weeks and we want to have more of an open drop-in hangout session. So rather than us talking at you and giving up and giving you our thoughts about the week, we're much more interested in getting people involved and getting questions from you um, as, as part of that hangout. Can anybody else help me here and say a little bit more about exactly how we're going to go ahead and do that? There's a challenge for you. Um, Wait, uh, I think I know. I think I know the answer. Uh, I was going to make it up. <laughs> okay. uh, go for it. Um, so uh, the times are listed in the MOOC site. And if you would like to come and have a chat with us during one of those um, hour all allotted hours, then um, I think the thing to do is to tweet uh, around the time when the Hangouts, uh, when the, the session is going to start, and we will invite you in. Um, and that is what we'll try to do. So we're not going to broadcast these. These won't be available for anyone, um, just anyone to watch. It'll be for people who, who are um, able to, to join us at one of the times. And we've tried to um, choose some times that straddle time zones and stuff so that hopefully if you'd like to attend, there'll be a time when you'll be able to manage. Um, and I think, that's, I think that was the plan. And Jeremy, if you want to say something about the excitement in the final week. Or shall I say something about the excitement in the final week? The final week is always exciting, Hamish. What do you mean? No, well, no, forgive me. Uh, 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 that, Berlin. that you and I are going to be in Berlin. Yes, that's right. I think we mentioned in the, in the yeah. Hangout previously, myself and Hamish will be at Online Educa in Berlin. I'll be talking about the MOOC. Um, and we will be around if anybody on this course or in previous instances, instances of the course want to say hello, then please do get in touch. We'll be there, I think, on, I'll certainly be there on the Thursday and the Friday. So I think Thursday afternoon you're, dash evening is when we're thinking might be a... Yeah, uh, your, your paper's on Thursday afternoon. And yes. we are going to try and do um, the Hangout uh, live, Jeremy and I, from Online Educa in Berlin. Um, if Online Educa in Berlin will <laughs> allow us to do that. Um, so yes, we will uh, we'll try and take some account of what's going on in the uh, in the conference and uh, uh, and pass it on through the uh, the medium of the hangout. And yes, if anyone happens to be at Online Educa in Berlin uh, week after next, it'd be great to see you. 
Okay, that I think is our hour up. So just as a last point, I want to say thank you to Rajiv, Whitney, and Kirsty for fantastic CTA work during the Hangout and throughout. That's it from us. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.